Okay, I think we should get started. So, um, let me uh, go back to, we were working, I was showing you a solution of a problem that I didn't get all the way through. So let me actually reduce some of that. So we were looking at the problem of, a, it's actually in your homework, um, a jet that hits a wall that is tilted at an angle. And remember, the, uh, the problem statement uh, makes the assumption that the jet splits into two branches, one that goes up the plate and another one that goes down the plate. And we are asked to find the um, force that is needed to hold that plate in place, and that force is perpendicular to the plate. And that's the part I did already, but I'm gonna quickly go over it again. And then we're also asked to find the mass flow rates in each of the branches. So, the first part of the solution, uh, first of all, looking at mass conservation, we know that um, the, since the jet splits into two, it must be true that all of the mass flow rate that comes with the jet has to be equal to the sum of the two mass flow rates of the splitting jets. And then I told you that one easy way to solve the problem is by using Bernoulli's equation. And I told you about following a couple of streamlines. One that it follows the upper branch, and then another one that follows the lower branch of the fluid. And if you apply Bernoulli's equation, uh, for example, if we take the upper branch, if we apply Bernoulli's equation from right before the jet hits the wall to another point right after it hits the wall, and we do the same thing for the lower branch, Bernoulli's equation tells us that the velocity has to be the same everywhere, because the pressure is the same everywhere, we ignore the hydrostatic component of the pressure in the Bernoulli equation, and therefore we come up with this result, that the velocities are the same in both branches, and in fact is the same as the velocity in the jet. So then when we want to get the forces, we uh, take um, Newton's second law, and applied in a direction perpendicular to the wall. So that is, we choose a coordinate system in which one coordinate goes along the wall and the other coordinate is normal to the wall. That makes things a little easier. So when you um, apply uh, Newton's second law using the Reynolds transport theorem, after assuming that the flow is steady, all you have is the flux, the momentum flux term, which must be balanced by the forces. So we went over uh, last time uh, evaluating the, the terms that uh, would come out of this integral. Uh, so but when I'm looking at the direction normal to the wall, the way I have the pen here, the um, momentum components of the two branches don't come in because they are parallel to the wall. So the only contribution to this integral comes from the incoming jet. And again, you have to look at these velocities that appear here separately. The quantity in parentheses is the normal. V dot n is the velocity normal to the area. So in that case, of course, that's minus V sub j, because it's going into the control volume. Whereas this other V that appears here is actually the velocity, the full velocity. So we look for the component of the velocity perpendicular to the wall, and that would be minus Vj sine theta. And that's the only contribution to this term. And so since the only force, if we remove the plate, we have to put a force there, F sub A, when we do a free body diagram of the control volume. And that immediately gives us the force. So if you uh, clean up this a little bit, uh, multiply Vj times Vj gives you the Vj square. Two negative signs give you a plus sign. So that's your force. And it comes out positive because 
is we put it pointing uh, in the positive direction away from the wall. So that verifies that indeed that's the force that the wall would apply on the on the uh, on the jet. The uh, opposite force would be applied on the wall. So that's that. That's more or less straightforward. That's what that's where we finished last time. Does anybody have a question about any of these? So then we do the same thing, but now we go parallel to the wall. So if I look at the, the same equation, Newton's second law parallel to the wall, and if we look at the schematic here, now we realize that there will be contributions to this surface integral from all three openings of the control volume, because now we are parallel to the wall, so the two branches contribute but even the incoming jet contributes a component parallel to the wall. So we know this will have three parts. And the three parts are there. So uh, the first one comes from the jet. This is actually very similar to what we did normal to the wall. The only thing that changes is that now we need the cosine theta for the component of the velocity that is parallel uh, to the wall. So that's the only difference between this term and the previous one. Well, there is a sign, too, because uh, in this case, this component of velocity is positive. Right? If I decompose this vector that I have here, the component that is parallel to the wall will point in the positive direction, which I chose to be the upward along the wall direction. So that changes, too. And then the last two terms are contributions to the integral from the two branches. And those are kind of easy in this problem because if you look at the v dot n, say for example we look at the upper branch, the v dot n is just v2 because the full velocity uh, is normal to the area there. So that's the v2 that appears here. And of course the component of the velocity itself of the vector is v2 also. So in this case the full v2 appears here and the full v2 appear there. And the same thing happens for the lower branch. For the lower branch, uh, again, the v dot n would give you uh, v1. And the velocity itself is minus v1 because it's in the negative direction. So that's, uh, you have to be careful with the signs as you do the calculation of the normal velocity and also of the component of the velocity. Be very careful because a wrong sign will mess up the numbers. So then, of course, that's the integral. The right-hand side is zero because in the direction uh, parallel to the wall, we have no forces. We're not accounting for friction, for example, with the wall that could create a tangential force. So neglecting friction along the wall, parallel to the wall, then that's zero. So that's then the equation for the direction uh, parallel to the wall, which we can, of course, uh, clean up a little bit. If we clean that up a little bit, uh, then realize, of course, that uh, uh, this pi dj squared over 4 is the area of the incoming jet. So the area times the velocity of the jet times rho is the mass flow rate coming with the jet. And then the same thing here, uh, rho times v2 times a2 is the mass flow rate going up the wall. That's m2 dot. And then this one, the same rho, v1, a1, would give me m1 dot. So that's the same equation simplified. And then, of course, I had already obtained the result when I used Bernoulli's equation that these velocities are all the same. So vj is equal to v2 is equal to v1. So we can divide by that velocity. And essentially, then, what this equation does is it gives us this relationship. m dot 1 minus m dot 2 equals minus m dot j cosine theta. So it's a relationship between the mass flow rates, m dot 1 and m dot 2, which you recall we're asked to find. We're asked to find m dot 1 and m dot 2. So this is one equation that relates m dot 1 and m dot 2, what is the other one? 
That equation relates m.1 to m.2. Do I have another equation that relates m.1 to m.2? Yeah, continuity. We, we looked at it earlier. So if I bring continuity back from the previous page, then by continuity, I know that the sum of the flows, the mass flow rates up and down the plate must be equal to the jet mass flow rate. So those are my two equations. I end up with two equations for two unknowns, and I can solve that for m.1 and m.2. So if I solve, for example, here what I easily did is just added the two equations. If I add these two equations, then I eliminate m.2, and then I can solve for m.1. So how much mass flows up the, uh, this is actually down the plate, m.1, uh, down the plate is half of the mass flow rate from the jet, but then times one minus cosine theta. And then if you solve for m.2, which I didn't do here, you obviously would get whatever is needed to complete um, uh, the full mass flow rate. So that's, that's the result. You know that m.2 is just m dot j minus m.1. And then you, when you get a result like that, you can very quickly check if it makes sense. How can I check if this result makes sense? Say that again? We have mj over the trees. Yeah. Well, okay. first we have the 1 minus cosine theta, so that's going to be between uh, 0 and 1. That's going to be between when the cosine of theta is uh, 0, it'll be 1. Uh, when it's uh, 1, it'll be 0. Right. How does that help you? Uh, Not that it makes sense. It makes sense to you. <laughs> well, um, here's what I would do. What happens if the plate is perpendicular, is, is vertical? What should be the result? The same flow rate in both directions and half, right? So that's, of course, going back to the figure. If the plate is vertical, theta is 90 degrees. The cosine of, the, of theta is 0. And you get half going up and half going down. Right? Is that what you were, yeah. kind of what you were thinking of? And what about if the plate is horizontal? <laughs> the plate is horizontal, then the jet essentially is just going past the, past the plate. It doesn't really hit the plate, it goes past it. And therefore, all of the mass really goes in the direction of two. Uh, so that's... Uh, uh, when theta is equal to zero, if theta is equal to zero, then this is zero. M dot one is zero. There is no mass flowing down. So that's one way to check if, um, if the result makes sense. All right, any questions? So like I said, this, this, the, this problem is in your homework, uh, but it also has a second part that I will uh, leave for you to do. The second part actually adds a little complication in the second part is do the problem again, but now the plate is moving with a constant speed. And so if the plate is moving with a constant speed, it might be going towards the jet or away from the jet. Obviously, if it's going away from the jet, maybe we're not the same velocity as the jet, otherwise the jet will never catch up, but um, some velocity that the plate has. So how will that change the results? if the plate is moving with a constant velocity, right? So I'll, I'll leave that one for you to, um, to finish. And if there are no questions about Newton's second law, I will move to the last part of this chapter. No questions? Which is, um, what is, what should be the last part? We have used the Reynolds transport theorem for Conservation of mass for Newton's second law. What's left? First law of thermodynamics. OK, so how do I apply this Reynolds transport theorem to the first law of thermodynamics? And so all right, so remember, we need to pick capital B, the property capital B. What should we pick for capital B? 
you can kind of see through the paper. <laughs> if you see through the paper. Energy, which energy? Huh? Internal energy. Internal energy only? Total energy. Total energy. First law applies to total energy. So I pick my B in the Reynolds transfer theorem to be total energy, and of course that makes lowercase b be the specific energy, total specific energy. So total energy per unit mass. So now about what about my second law? Well, my second law tells me that for a system, right, for a control mass, <coughs> the uh, variation of the total energy in, in that mass, in that system, must be equal to using the sign convention to the uh, the rate at which heat is being added minus the rate at which work is being done by the system. That's the first law for a closed system, or what we call a system here. So uh, now, one thing that you, I'm not going to go over this in a lot of detail because uh, we do that in thermo, but uh, the only thing that we have to be careful is that the work that we have here uh, may include the traditional forms of work, like moving boundary work or a shaft rotating or any other form of, of work uh, like that, plus the work involved in putting stuff through the boundary, right? the so-called flow work. So if I also make it positive when something is coming out, then that's... Um, uh, positive here, and of course it will appear negative there. So this one that I'm calling other is boundary work and shaft work for the most part for us. Right? So remember, the flow work is what happens when you're taking something out. So here's my control volume, and suppose that a chunk of my mass is going out. Remember, this equation is for a system, so my system has to remain the same. So that means if this stuff comes out, my system boundary would have to adjust so that, it, so that it takes that. But at an instant, there will be work pushing that out. And uh, also from thermodynamics, you might remember that that's what the flow work is. This is easy to remember because V dot N, again, is the normal velocity. Right? So if you take the pressure, multiply it, uh, times the normal, the pressure times the area gives you the force, the force times the velocity gives you the power, right? The, the, the work per unit time. So that's the only thing that we have to be careful with when we apply the Reynolds transport theorem to this first law, that we, we should split the work into the regular type of work and the flow work. So, we, because we treat that separately. All right, so we do that. And then we say, well, what's in my total energy? My total energy will have internal energy, the same things we put in thermal. Uh, internal energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. The only thing to note is that I am calling the internal energy U tilde, just because I don't want to be confused with velocity in this class. So internal energy in thermodynamics would just be U, but here's U tilde. So that's E, and of course, lowercase e is the same thing, but per unit mass. So uh, lowercase u, this is just half velocity square and, and gz. So that goes in the energy. U, is, U tilde is the internal energy. So if I now remember my Reynolds transport theorem, the term that I'm trying to evaluate is this, the variation of the energy per unit time in the system, and here's the two terms from the Reynolds transport theorem. Nothing new, really. All, all we've done in the Reynolds transport theorem is replace the lowercase b that appeared in, the, in this integral and this integral with a lowercase e for energy. So that's the expression that comes from the Reynolds transport theorem. But this is still equal, of course, to the other side that we know from first law, which is the heat transfer, the net heat transfer in, net work out, and here's the flow work, which I kept separate. And of course, uh, what you should note immediately is that these two integrals are of the same type. 
they are the integrals over the surface. Okay? This, of course, is the flow of energy through the surface, and this is the flow work done at that same surface. So I can combine these two, the two integrals over the control surface, I can combine into one, just put everything under one integral. And if I do that, then the combination gives me this. I'm just putting these two together. So uh, lowercase e was internal energy per unit mass plus kinetic energy per unit mass plus potential energy per unit mass. And I've just added this term, which adds a p. But since I have the rho out there, I multiply it and divide it by rho so that I write it p over rho times rho, which gives me the p. Right? So I write it like that. So that is the surface integral. So rather than having these two separate surface integrals, I'll just have one that has all of that. All right? Everybody following? Question? OK. So when I put it all together, then that's what we have. So I didn't touch this term. This is the first integral, the, the time derivative of the integral over the volume that comes from the Reynolds transport theorem. And now here's the surface integral, which now has this additional term, p over rho. Remember, that's from the flow work. And then on the right-hand side, I still have my heat transfer rate and my work, my power for the conventional types of power. So nothing really too dramatic. Now let's, so this is again going back to uh, your question from, uh, from last time. You know, you wanted to know the difference between a very general form of the equation and a simplified one. So this would be the general one. This would be very general. And then, of course, when we're going to solve our problems, which are a little simpler, we can simplify it. So, for example, suppose we say that the flow is steady. Move that up even more. Actually, let me keep that there for a little bit. Let's assume that the flow is steady. And in our control volume, that there is only one place where mass flows in and one place where mass flows out, because that's kind of the way our engineering devices, most of the ones that we look at, operate. OK, so what can I simplify here if the flow is steady? <coughs> Practice question. In that equation, in the general equation, what can I simplify? The flow is steady. The first integral vanishes, right? It's zero. Because there's a time derivative in, in the control volume. Nothing changes per time. So if the flow is steady, I can eliminate that integral. And if I only have one inlet and one outlet, let's look at that first before we say that it's uniform. If there is one inlet and one outlet, where does that enter here? Well, let's see first. The integral is over the entire control surface. If there is only one inlet and one outlet, what happens to the integral? I would have two integrals. One for one of the openings and another one for the other opening. Right? So, so remember, because you can always break down this integral into as many integrals as openings you have in your control volume. So if you only had two, there will be only two of them. Say one for the inlet and one for the outlet. But if furthermore we say now that over that area, right, have an area the flow is going in, the flow is uniform over that area, then what happens? If nothing changes over the area, it's the same velocity, the same pressure everywhere on that area where the flow is going through, what happens? Terms come out of the integral. I can take this whole parenthesis out. Okay? Nothing changes over the area. The density doesn't change over the area. I take it out. V dot n is the normal velocity. 
on that spot, on that area. So rho, and then of course the only thing that stays inside is the DA. So it integrates to the area. So really what I have is rho, normal velocity times area, which is mass flow rate. So I would have one of those for the inflow and one of those for the outflow. Which the one for the outflow is the one that is positive and the one for the inflow is negative. So that will boil down, that integral will boil down to two terms. One for the outflow, which is the positive one, and one for the inflow, which is the negative one. And of course there is the m dot, because I only have one inlet and one outlet and the flow is steady, these m dots have to be the same. That's why I didn't make a distinction m dot in and m dot out, because it is implicit in my assumptions that it has to be, they have to be the same. All right? And of course, the right-hand side doesn't change. The, the heat transfer and the work terms are there. So this is a simpler version of the first law of thermodynamics in a flow problem. It has these assumptions in it. You could do some additional simplifications here, for example. Can you simplify these four terms further? The terms in the parentheses. And you shrink the parentheses. How? What about, what about the P over rho? No, I'm, I'm not saying it's, what are you saying is constant, constant pressure. It was over the area, but what am I going to do with that? You can combine the terms of U and Q. And get enthalpy. So if I wanted to, I could bring enthalpy into the game and just shrink, go from four terms to three terms, and I would have that. It's the same equation, really, just uh, a little easier to write. There's one less term in each of the parentheses. So either one, you can uh, leave it in terms of internal energy or put it in terms of enthalpy. Now, as you look at this equation, it looks somewhat like what? Yeah, it has, it has some aspects of Bernoulli's equation in it. Obviously, it's not. There's more stuff in this equation. There's more terms than in Bernoulli's equation. But we may want to think about um, a comparison. Let me keep this one, the, the one where I left it in terms of u. Right? And so um, suppose that I want to compare this to Bernoulli's equation. Well, if I look at the green one here, that is barely above there, right? I see that the one half v squared plus, rho, plus gz plus p over rho, that's part of the Bernoulli equation. Right? And in fact, I have it there at, at the outlet, and then I have it there at the inlet. So let's isolate those terms. So let's write it like this. All right, let's put those terms separate on the left side. One half v squared plus gc plus p over rho out minus one half v squared plus gc plus p over rho in, and then equals, and then put everything else on the right hand side. All right? So what is going to go on the right hand side? What I left out here, for example, was the u's, the internal energies. They'll have to go to the right hand side. And of course, there is the heat transfer and the work. So when I put them on the right hand side, I get that. Notice that I also divided by m dot. So I've divided by m dot. And therefore, this is now a lowercase q and a lowercase w, because now these are no longer heat transfer per unit time like they were up there, or work per unit time, but now they are per unit mass. Heat, heat transfer per unit mass, work per unit mass. So when I, when I look at this and I look at Bernoulli's equation, I realized that this stuff that was put on the right-hand side is the difference. If I didn't have all this stuff here, if this was equal to zero, then it's Bernoulli's equation. So what is happening, of course, is that we have come up with an equation that is more general 
than Bernoulli's equation. It's more general because it, it takes into account uh, terms that we, did, that we did not take into account in the Bernoulli equation. In particular, for example, if I am following a, uh, a streamline, but it so happens that there is work that gets done between the first point and the second point, or that there is heat transfer between the first point and the second point, that can be taken into account here. What is also hidden here is the concept of energy loss. What are the units of this equation? The way I wrote it here at the end. Kilojoules per kilogram, so energy per unit uh, mass. So this equation is energy per unit mass. And we know that um, the second law of thermodynamics tells us something about loss of energy. That you usually end up losing energy in a process because, because the process is actually irreversible. So without really going through a lot of the details, we can put that in here. And we can rewrite the equation in a little bit more convenient form, realizing that there is an energy loss and somehow this term is related to that you still see that term? Yeah. The, um, let me leave this a little lower. Uh, this term right here is related to the loss. So what I, the way that is convenient to write it then, by recognizing that, is here's the first term, which is the same as before, as in the full uh, equation above. So the Bernoulli part out minus the Bernoulli part in, and then equals, and then I have the heat transfer, the work, and a loss because I know that I will definitely lose energy in any process. This is actually a very powerful equation uh, because, for example, suppose that you say, well, there is no heat added or removed from the system and there is no work. There is no way I could get rid of this term, no matter what. So that's one convenient version of the equation. You have a streamline, you can follow it, you can account for the losses, which really means that the energy per unit mass that you have at the second point is always going to be less than the energy per unit mass that you had at the first point because there is a loss. So this one will always be larger than that. The second one is the in one larger than the second one. The, the difference is that energy loss. So now you can do problems in which uh, you can take that into account. And I want to show you an example, uh, unless there are questions about the derivation. Let's look at a very simple problem where we can put this to use. So, We didn't look at a problem exactly like this when we were using Bernoulli's equation, but we could now. But, but it's, so, I, so there is a few additional ingredients that we couldn't handle before. So it's very simple. Suppose you have a body of water down here. This is, you know, suppose this is a lake or a pond or some, some place where there is water. And what you want to do is you want to take water from that lake and feed it through a pump so you can bring it up to, a, to fill up a tank that is at a higher elevation. Very common situation. So, so there is your, um, your one. Pretend that you're following a streamline that goes from the surface of the lake and goes in through the, this uh, suction, in, suction pipe for the pump, goes through the pump, and then goes up, and then you finish that streamline on the surface of the water at the tank up there. So that's my streamline. In the previous, when we were just looking at the simple Bernoulli equation, we couldn't deal with this situation. Uh, but now we can, because now we have an equation that would allow us to account for the work added to the fluid by the pump and even the losses. 
So let's say, for example, that um, all these quantities are given. Suppose that we know this is actually, this Q is actually flow rate. Do not confuse it with the Q that we were just looking at that was heat transfer. So the same Q dot as before, just uh, volumetric flow rate. Suppose I know the flow rate. Suppose I know the difference in height between the surface of the lake and the surface of the water in the tank, uh, the property of the fluid, and I know my, the power that the pump produces. And I am asked to find what is the loss, what, what kind of an energy loss do I have here. So this brings the concept of head loss. Nothing different, really, when we were looking at the equation just a moment ago. Right? We were talking about energy loss, E, because this equation is energy per unit mass. But remember, I can also write the Bernoulli equation so that it has units of length. Right? Now it has units of energy per unit mass. What do I need to do to this equation to convert it to an equation that has units of length? Divide by G. Very easy. You just look at this term. And you say, if I divide this whole equation by G, then I have Bernoulli's equation in terms of lengths. That's what I call heads in um, hydraulics. So the, the, the ter each term is now a head. So you have a dynamic head, a static head, and so on, because um, it's written in terms of that. So that's what we're asked to find, the head loss. So we take the equation, of course, we would divide it by uh, G. So we write it in terms of heads. And then we write our equation. And of course, we notice all these uh, points that we can assume. Right? Suppose that the levels don't really change rapidly. So we can say that the velocities are negligible at the two surfaces. We need that because otherwise the problem is unsteady. And in the original Bernoulli equation, or even the one that we just derived, the energy equation, we did assume steadiness. So those, has to be, those have to be small. The pressures, obviously, are all the same, because both surfaces are exposed to atmosphere. And if I put the reference level at the surface of this lake, then Z2 is just H. Okay? So when I write my equation, this is now in terms of heads. It's the same equation, so instead of having a lowercase w, because I'm dividing by g, the pump comes in as a, it adds a head to the fluid. And then there is the loss. Uh, this is written with the one first. So this is the incoming, this is the outgoing. That's why the signs changed. So anyway, uh, that's my equation, my energy equation that I just derived. But I get rid of the terms that I can simplify. So. Velocity, velocity, pressure, pressure. All I have, of course, is the Z1 and the Z2. And then immediately I know that the loss, the energy loss measured in terms of heads, is the head added by the pump minus the height of the, the difference in height between the two levels. As easy as that. Of course, this H, if you want to get it, because what was given to you was the power, the pump power. But you take the pump power divided by the volume flow rate and by gamma, and then you get the, the H. So that's a very simple problem that um, incorporates these concepts. And if I had another problem, for example, in which I'm adding heat to the fluid, then I could also take that into account, because I also have a heat transfer term. Any questions? No questions? OK, so this concludes this uh, uh, fifth chapter in the text and also the lecture. Uh, because the next material actually comes from chapter 6. And we'll start looking at that on Monday. So we'll finish, what, 10 minutes earlier today. And if anybody didn't get any candy, I have more. <laughs> <laughs>